All right. Thank you, Denise. And thank you all for taking the time to be here. I know your time is valuable. Um, I hope you will be able to take a couple items today and put them in practice at your sites. Um, we'll try to keep this moving for you guys and get you out of here in, in under an hour. I know it's, it's a busy time. Um, so quickly, we'll go through some objectives for the presentation today. That would be to understand the current enforcement status of USP 797, to identify key measures for accreditation and inspection preparation, uh, to anticipate any new inspection priorities or potential pitfalls or you know blind spots at your site. And then to understand the current landscape of compliance enforcement. So um, we're not going to be covering, you know, the specific nitty gritty details of the chapter uh, today necessarily. Uh, it's going to be more focused on what can we do to make sure um, we're prepared for an inspection. Many of us have been talking about and thinking about and planning for 797 for a long time. And now we want to make sure what we're putting in practice is, is going to be able to stand up to the test of an inspection from Joint Commission or, or Board of Pharmacy. So some quick background information, uh, there's really four currently enforceable USP chapters. You have 795, which covers the compounding of non-sterile preparations, uh, USP 797, which covers the compounding of sterile preparations and will be the focus of our presentation today. USP 800 that covers hazardous drug uh, preparation, both sterile and non-sterile, and then uh, USP 825, which covers radiopharmaceuticals. Um, all the USP chapters could be surveyed by Joint Commission or State Boards of Pharmacy, depending on uh, what type of practices you have at your site. Uh, a little background timeline, USP 797 was originally published in 2004. Uh, four years later, that was revised and republished. And then that 2008 version actually remained the standard for 15 years, which is pretty long for something like this. Um, there were several revision periods and comment periods. Uh, there was even a, a go live date that was provided and then postponed. And in late 2022, we got the final 797 um, chapter sent out to everybody and kind of available to look at. And, and with a go live date, uh, November 1st, 2023, one year later. So, you know, we've been operating about six months or so, almost six months since that go live date. Some goals of the new chapter uh, per USP were to make it a little easier to read, a little more straightforward, and also to kind of beef up the training and documentation requirements. There's a lot of changes outside of that, um, but those were definitely some of the focuses. And, and anytime you see something that, that you know, these revisions started around 2015, and so we've been talking about these revisions now for almost 10 years, and anytime something's been going on that long, once it is final, it's obviously anticipated that it will be a big focus uh, for surveyors and regulators in, in your area, um, both locally and nationally. And I think that is what we've seen um, when, when surveyors are coming on site, 797 is, is the hot topic for pharmacy or, or 800, one of those two USB chapters, and even 795 a little bit. Uh, some just quick reminders about 797. Um, it provides the minimum standards to be followed when preparing compound and sterile preparations. I think I've seen some sites over the years kind of fall into this trap that 797 is like a, a pinnacle or a goal that we'll get to someday. Um, and that's not really where you should be with 797 compliance. It's the minimum standards. These are the things that you need to do as a minimum to ensure you're creating you know, quality products for the safety of your patients. Um, and if there's things you can do to go and be above and beyond the chapter that improve that quality or safety, then you should try to do it if you can. Um, Along those same lines, one key factor to, to point out the as you're reading the chapter and kind of navigating things is if it says should or may in 797 or 800 or 795, those are recommendations. They're not absolute requirements that you have to follow. I mean, you can kind of view any statement that says should, you should do this or you should do that kind of as a best practice. If you can do it, it's great to do it. If you can't, it's not an absolute requirement. However, if it says must in a statement, you must do this, then that is an absolute requirement that you could be expected to be held accountable for. Um, and is it important to keep that in mind? I've seen some places that are in unique situations. Maybe they're an abnormally small site or even an abnormally large site, or they have some unique setups that certain part of 797 just don't necessarily apply to them or don't at least necessarily add any value to their to their practice. And they're spending all these times like, oh, how are we going to comply with this? Or why would we do this? And they're trying to jump through all these hoops and design processes around something that is a should or a may in 797. And if it's a should, it's not a requirement. And if it doesn't add value for you, you don't necessarily have to do it. So just keep that in mind before you try to jump through a bunch of hoops or do something that maybe isn't required and isn't adding value. 
kind of along those same lines, um, set yourself up for compliance success. The Joint Commission has stated they will only write standards to the musts and will not hold sites accountable to the shoulds unless it's in your local policies and procedures, your SOPs. So um, they've also stated around 65% of the Joint Commission findings are actually based, and this is pertaining to med management, are actually based on the institution's SOPs and not on the standards. So you would think that most of the findings or violations that Joint Commission's finding uh, pertains to their standards, but they actually more often than not are getting uh, findings at sites based on sites violating their own policies and procedures. So along those same lines, when you're when you're writing those local policy procedures, be careful on how many of the shoulds or may uh, type of items are included in the policies. You know, ask yourself, can we actually achieve this consistently and reliably? And if you can't, then maybe don't include it in your policy or at least put some work around it and, and get to a point where you can do it consistently before you put it in your policy. Um, I've seen some sites who are even copying and pasting like all of 797 into a policy or all of an entire section of 797, like literally screenshots into policies. I don't necessarily recommend that because it, it can be hard to comply with and you're now putting all those shoulds into your policy, all of them, if you're screenshotting and posting or, or typing word for word in your policies, try to avoid that if you can. Essentially, don't make it more difficult on yourself than you have to. Uh, I saw an interesting quote from, from Robert Campbell, who's the Joint Commission Director of Clinical Standards Interpretation Group and the Director for the Medication Management for Joint Commission. And he said, great policies don't always mean great care. Great policies can also mean you've set too high a bar, one that nobody within your organization can reach. So just keep that in mind when you're developing these USP policies. Um, just a little USP 800 kind of tidbit, and we're going to talk mostly about 797 today, but per the USP website and what they've stated, USP 800 is only applicable and compendially required to the extent in which 795 and 797 apply. So for hazardous drugs, what that means is USP is enforceable only when a practitioner is compounding, and that is because USP 800 really references back to 795 and 797 for a lot of sections. And 795 and 797 do not cover administration of medications. It states that in both chapters. So what USP is saying is essentially, since administration is out of the scope of 795 and 797, the USP would, 800 would not be applicable or compendially required in the context of administration. Now, again, this is per USP. USP does not play a role in enforcement. Um, they create the standards, publish the standards, and give recommendations. It's ultimately up to organizations like the Joint Commission and Board of Pharmacy to enforce them. The Joint Commission has said that they will essentially follow this USP you know, recommendation that from their standpoint, uh, the administration parts of USP 800 uh, would not be enforceable. However, some boards of pharmacy um, have not taken that same stance and are viewing the administration portions of USP 800 as enforceable. So what I would recommend you do um, since each state can be a little different, on most Board of Pharmacy sites, there's kind of a generic email you can send inquiries or questions to. It might not hurt to reach out to your local, you know, uh, inquiry email or whatever it is for your Board of Pharmacy in your state and just ask if they are enforcing um, USP 100 from an administration standpoint or from a compounding standpoint only. And it may even be beneficial to, you know, go over to the USP site and pull this information and include that in your inquiry because um, that may be educational for them as well. Um, but this is really important. You know, the other part of this is if you put administration related stuff pertaining to USP 800 in your policies, as I talked about on the last slide, you are going to be held accountable to it from that standpoint. So keep that in mind as well. Um, when we look at, at Joint Commission and Board of Pharmacy Enforcement of, of USP, um, USP does have FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, for all their chapters on their website. I put the, the link there, or not the link, but the, the website. Um, these are fantastic resources. If, if you're an infection preventionist or a pharmacist who, you know, is getting tripped up on a certain topic or having trouble interpreting exactly what does this section of USP 797 mean, most likely that question is answered in those FAQs. I think the 797 section of it's 90 some pages um, of FAQs, which is kind of a lot. But if you set aside some time to sit down and read through it line by line, I think you will 100% find it valuable. Also, um, if you're a joint commission you know, site, which most hospitals are, um, and you, you probably have some type of, of regulatory or accreditation person at your hospital that has access to joint commission resources, 
Um, they have a compounding assessment tool that actually can help you assess. It's kind of a gap analysis on where we're at and where we need to be and, and maybe where our pitfalls could be. Um, I would recommend you, you know, reach out to your accreditation person and try to get access to those resources. Also, Joint Commission publishes their standards. They're obviously out there. You can see what they are. There's a If you just do some Googling or looking around on the Joint Commission website, you're going to be able to find a document that they put out in June of 2023, uh, the Joint Commission, that stated changes to the medication management standards pertaining to compounding. So it's a really great document. It's kind of long like those FAQs, but you can go through line by line and look at what statements and standards the Joint Commission has added pertaining to compounding in the last year and make sure that you're covered from that standpoint. Board of Pharmacy inspections are a little tougher. Uh, they tend to vary pretty widely state to state in terms of what's enforced and what's not. And also the information like their standards and whatnot for most states are, are just a little bit less readily available. So in my experience, you know, the, the best thing to do is, is go to webinars like this. Um, you being here is a good first step to find other resources like this. Um, and, and, and the best source of truth above all else though is recent inspections. And so, you know, I think, you know, working in the pharmacy or working in infection prevention over the years, most of us have contacts at other local hospitals that we've built relationships with um, via working together on certain things, or even maybe we used to work at another hospital, now we've switched or, or vice versa. Someone that used to work for us now works over there. Um, utilize those contacts, reach out, see if anyone in your local area has had an inspection from your local board of pharmacy recently. Because one thing we definitely see is these surveyors, you know, they can't know everything. They can't inspect everything. There's usually a couple key topics or parts of the USB chapters that they really hone in on or focus in on or like to ask people about or, or certain documentation they really like to look for. And it's pretty consistent inspection to inspection what that is because it's the same inspector on these boards of pharmacy a lot of times going around to, to the different sites in your area. So if you can find out what those are and what things they were really focused on, um, that is extremely valuable from a board of pharmacy standpoint. So on the regulatory focus, what we're going to talk about today, um, there's kind of three sections we'll break it down in. Um, the personnel training and evaluation and all the documentation that comes along with that. Um, and then an observation of your actual practices. Um, so they want to come in and look at that personnel training and evaluation documentation to kind of make sure it appears on paper, you're doing everything properly. And then the surveyor is also going to want to observe those practices actually in practice and make sure, yeah, you say you're doing all this stuff and it looks great on paper, but do your staff, are they educated and trained well enough to follow what's on paper? And then a definite big focus seems to be environmental monitoring right now. Uh, this is based on several joint commission, recent joint commission surveys, as well as a couple board of pharmacy in, in a couple different states. Um, they really are, are wanting to look at the environmental monitoring that you're doing and the documentation of that. And so we'll kind of talk about each of these three sections uh, here moving forward. So first, that personnel training and documentation, um, they want to know what training and, and documentation you have and that that training is documented is very important. You can have the best training program in the world, but if you're not able to show that on paper, um, it doesn't necessarily count in the eye of a, of a surveyor. This documentation of all your training and kind of baseline documentation on, uh, you know, glow fingertip testing and all this different stuff um, is often the first item a surveyor is going to want to look at. Um, it's very easy to find violations and documentation. 797 is pretty specific on what needs to be in your documentation and what intervals you need to do media fill and glove fingertip testing and surface sampling, et cetera. And so if you're not, you know, falling within those parameters, then it's, it's pretty straightforward that they've located a violation or a finding. Um, they're looking for very specific items to be documented when it's called out specifically in 797. And what I mean by that is in some areas of 797, it will say, you know, for this item, for this glove fingertip or this media fill or this, whatever it is, there's a list line by line. You must have this, 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 this documented. They're literally going down and making sure each one of those are documented. Because again, if you miss one, it's pretty easy to find a violation. So some examples, if you're doing media fill testing, you must have the certificate of analysis for whatever commercial sterile microbial growth media you use. And you must document the temperatures and time frames that all your samples were incubated at. That's definitely a big one right now because it wasn't real specific in old 797 on what temperatures and time frames um, glove fingertip paddles or surface sampling paddles or media fill bags had to be incubated at. And that is very specific in 797 now. 
Also, items like master formulation records, which is a, a something is essentially like a recipe for all your batching, as well as a compounding record for your non-batch products. Those are kind of newer topics in 797, and they provide a very specific list of what must be documented in your master formulation or compounding record. So make sure you go through that line by line and make sure you're completing that. Um, any specific documentation list like that needs to be in place because in my experience recently is as recent as a month ago the surveyors are very interested in documentation like that a um, couple other things that seem to be a focus um, it is stated now in 797 that the designated person at your site must notify staff of any new or revised SOPs pertaining to CSPs so if you make a change to your policy then it pertains to uh, compounded sterile preparations that change must be communicated to your staff. That's a must. And that communication must be documented. You can't just say, oh, well, we told them all in a department huddle and it's not documented where you need to send it out via email or have some way you can show that. It's also recommended, it's a should, that their acknowledgement of receiving that, you know, maybe whether it's a red receipt on an email or whatever, um, should be documented. So that's a recommendation, but not something you have to do. But you do have to have good documentation that you're informing your staff anytime that there's a change to policies pertaining to CSPs. Uh, you must have annual competencies in place. These can be written or electronic and test over certain CSP principles and practices. Um, some examples of CSP uh, principles and practices are provided in 797, so make sure you see those. But it must include calculations. That's one I've seen a lot of sites miss that surveyors are kind of looking for. Um, they want to be sure that the people that are preparing uh, CSPs in your site are able to do the basic uh, calculations required to make sure they're getting the right mLs or milligrams or whatever. Um, in their products. So make sure you have calculations on those tests. Also on, on whatever tests or competencies um, you do, make sure they're designating if it's pass or fail and what their actual score was. So if they got a 90% and that's a pass, you should whoever is grading or assessing this should be writing them on there if it's manual, or you should be able to see that somewhere um, electronically if you're doing it through some other electronic method. Um, Joint Commission, for example, has like in their uh, program when they're doing their surveys, they have to put like a person's name and what their title is. And then they have to put if the annual competency was done and what that score was and what if it was pass fail, they have to input all that into their system. And they kind of sit there and do that as they're surveying you. So if you have that stuff written out, it makes it much more straightforward. Immediate use compounding is another really big um, focus. It seems this time around that didn't seem to be as a focus of, as much in my experience in the past. I think the reason for that is Previously, immediate use compounding in 797 only had one hour beyond use date. That's been upgraded to four hours or increased to four hours. Also, previously, uh, it said immediate use compounding should be reserved for only emergent or urgent types of situation. And there's no mention of that anymore in 797. It just gives uh, what immediate use compounding is and what the requirements are to qualify. It doesn't say it must be used for emergent situations. So with the little less restrictions and the additional dating, um, combined with a lot of pharmacy technician and even pharmacist staffing shortages in the nation, um, I think there's more sites maybe doing a little bit more immediate use compounding than what they've done in the past, which is probably part of why there's a focus on it. The important thing to remember with this is that 797 now states that anyone who does immediate use compounding must complete training and demonstrate competency in aseptic technique and processes. So that wasn't necessarily required in the past. It doesn't give an interval. It just says this has to be done. So at least at baseline, anyone who's doing immediate use compounding at your site needs to have training and demonstrate competency in aseptic technique and processes. Joint commission standard, if you look at that document that I told you about with their changes to their medication management, um, standards says you also have to do it every three years. So, um, and I have I have heard of some board of pharmacies even requiring this annually. So the important thing is to find out um, where in your sites are you doing immediate use compounding. Uh, most of the time, this actually isn't pharmacy staff, which is why this can get overlooked. Um, unless you're in one of those short staff situations or you have a major you know, compliance issue with your clean room and have to do immediate use compounding for a while, it's not usually pharmacy because pharmacy is usually mixing everything in a, in a hood in a classified space. The immediate use compounding tends to be um, nursing maybe after hours at a, at a site where they're not open 24 hours or even more importantly, anesthesia providers. Almost every hospital in the nation has anesthesia providers who are diluting meds and syringes and drawing them up or diluting and 
meds into a bag and administering them in OR. And that is considered immediate use compounding. And they are included in this requirement to have training and demonstrate competency in aseptic technique initially and in, in every three years. So, you know, if you're an infection preventionist, a lot of times this gets overlooked by pharmacists because we're focused on pharmacy and we don't always think about the other areas in the hospital that might be doing immediate use compounding. And you can kind of assist and make sure that you're covered from this standpoint, because what the surveyors are really looking for is for you to miss getting anesthesia, essentially. They want to make sure your anesthesia staff have this training documented. Just a couple more things on the training and evaluation. There's a lot of beyond use date changes in the new, new 797. Um, I've listed out kind of the most common ones there for category one, and then the most common dating for category two, if you're using sterile products and not doing sterilization or anything. You can get different dating than this if you do terminal sterilization or if, if you do category three mixing and some of this other stuff. So um, this is just a reference. The important thing is make sure a lot of sites have these beyond use date charts or tables printed out and they might be stuck in random drawers or on the walls somewhere in your pharmacy so techs can reference them when they're mixing. You need to make sure you get rid of all those because they do have outdated information on them and make sure people are using the correct reference. Um, surface sampling required monthly now. I'm sure most of you are aware of that, which is a challenge. Um, and then the gloved fingertip testing and media fill, hand hygiene, stuff like that was annually every six months now. This is a big lift. If you're a big site who has a lot of staff members, if you're a lot of a big pharmacy with many, many staff members. This is really challenging to get this monthly surface sampling and the every six month uh, other stuff done. So um, if, if at all possible, I recommend you get a software for this, get some type of vendor set up that you can have all your users in. You can put in the intervals that they have to get it done. It will send you know reminders when people are coming up or if people are past due. And uh, you can document, um, you know, the Joint Commission survey we had recently documented the lot number and expiration date for all the media fill bags and the, the glove fingertip paddles we use. They wanted us to provide that for each individual person and each competency they looked at. So, you know, it's a lot of sorting through papers and finding this stuff if you don't have the software. Um, the last Board of Pharmacy inspector we had at a site actually said, oh, you have Simplify 797, which is a common uh, vendor used for this. This will be very simple. So the surveyors are aware of the sites that have these. It is beneficial for both the surveyor and the site. Um, also, you, you know, you can document in there those specific incubation temperatures and time frames and things like that. So it's very clear what you did. So after they check all your policies and procedures and everything looks good on paper, like I said, they want to observe the actual practices and, and make sure when staff compound and garb and do all that stuff um, that they're doing it correctly. Um, this is a focus of Joint Commission. In, in my experience, the last two we've had, they've wanted to do this a little bit. The Board of Pharmacy in both states has been highly interested in this and spent a lot of time actually observing practices. So I can't say that's nationwide, but in my experience, it seems to be uh, a definite focus of the Board of Pharmacy in most, most places. Um, one thing they're definitely looking at, and, and this is something that if you're an infection preventionist, you can go kind of assist with and look around. Pharmacies in and out of these rooms all the time, and sometimes we don't notice things that look out of place or wrong. And, and they're really focusing in on the integrity of the facility structures, it seems. So is there somewhere where a cart moves back and forth a bunch or some table moves back and forth a bunch and it's rubbed on the wall in the clean room and now the, the paint's rubbed off or even you know worse there's the the drywall's compromised in some way and we're used to just seeing it all the time and walking by it and don't really think about the fact that oh you know compromised drywall is, is a good possible source of contamination for this room it needs to be fixed so make sure your facility structures are good you don't have you know holes on the wall or missing paint or or thing you know some certain shelf just looks really dirty for some reason because they keep missing cleaning it uh, or something like that. You know, this is something as an inf infection preventionist, you can go around and we're going to talk about observation of, of practices for hand hygiene and stuff and, on upcoming slides. If you just want to jot down some notes, it can kind of be a good checklist for you um, as an infection preventionist or even a pharmacy leader, designated person of some things you can look for, do the observations yourself ahead of time. You know, you can correct some of these actions um, before you have a surveyor stand there watching it. And they definitely seem to have been heavily focused on observing the cleaning processes. We actually had one surveyor uh, require us to do a full one of our monthly cleanings, even though we weren't due for it, because they wanted to witness the person do it and make sure that their cleaning process and the items they use 
to clean actually matched what 797 said. They want to make sure, you know, you're cleaning from clean to dirty, meaning you start in the hood, then go to the, the clean room, then go to the ante room and not going vice versa where you may contaminate the dirty spaces. They want to make sure your staff know the appropriate wet times or kill times and actually follow that and actually time it. Um, they want to make sure you're using disposable mop heads, you're using separate mops for hazardous versus non-hazardous. And then uh, one big one for sure to note, because uh, it's a change in new 797, is they want to make sure you're using only sterile products in the hood. So, um, you know, whatever you use to clean or disinfect in the hood, um, it's kind of counterintuitive, but many of those are not labeled as sterile. You know, you're using them to disinfect or sterilize the hood. So you would think they would be labeled as sterile. Many of them are not. So double check whatever product, you know, you, you see the pharmacy staff or see your staff cleaning with in the hood. Is it labeled as sterile on the bottle? If not, you need to switch products and, and get switched to a sterile product. Now, again, that only applies to what goes in the hood in terms of what goes on the walls, floors, ceilings, outside the hood, counters. That does not have to be sterile. And I would recommend you don't use a sterile product for that. You use a different product because the sterile products are significantly more expensive and it requires a lot of cleaning product to cover floor, ceiling, walls, and all that type of stuff. So observation uh, of hand hygiene. This is a, a big one. Hand hygiene is obviously always important across the hospital system, but definitely when you're preparing sterile products. Um, needs to be a minimum of 30 seconds. And in both Joint Commission and Board of Pharmacy that we just had within the last three months asked, uh, how do you know you've washed your hands for 30 seconds? So one of the sites, it was easy. There's a timer that actually kicks on and off as you turn the sink off and on. If you can have that, that's great. If not, they're, get a clock or get something they can see to do the time. Or I know even some sites, I think if you hum happy birthday to yourself two times, it's about 30 seconds. Just make sure your staff can speak to how do they know they've washed for 30 seconds. Because sometimes um, you feel like you've been washing your hands forever and it's only been 20 seconds and then you're not meeting that requirement. Um, they can't use brushes of any kind to scrub their hands. Um, they can't use refillable soap containers. So they might ask, you know, uh, what do you do when your soap runs out in here? And they're looking for somebody to say, oh, well, we just get this bottle of soap and dump it back into this one. And, and that would be incorrect. They need to use um, disposable soap containers. So they should be throwing them away when they're done. Um, also, you cannot have the, the hand dryers that you see, like the automatic hand dryers you see in like a lot of uh, public restrooms. Um, unfortunately, those were put in in a lot of clean rooms for some reason around the time when all these revisions were happening and people were, you know, doing these big capital projects and building new clean rooms. They got popular and a lot of people put in these automatic hand dryers. Those are not permitted. Um, and you do need to get those removed and just use, you know, disposable low lint wipes to dry your hands. And then staff must also sanitize their hands with alcohol based hand sanitizer before donning sterile gloves. So after they wash their hands, complete their hair and hygiene. Before they put on their sterile gloves, they should be using a hand sanitizer in between. After the hand hygiene is going to be um, garbing. Uh, one important thing, we got a couple questions before the webinar. Uh, you know, why does the pharmacy staff put their booties on as their last step before they go in the clean room? And it actually said, why does 797 require staff to do that? And 797 doesn't require that. Um, 797 actually doesn't define the order of how uh, the staff have to garb. It states you should define that in your SOPs based on what works for your facility and makes sense, and then your staff should follow what's in your SOPs. So you can garb in the order that makes the most sense for you. Some sites have their sink in their ante room, some have it outside their ante room. So the order of how you garb and do things might be a little different based on your facility layout. You should, is similar with the cleaning from clean to dirty, you should garb from clean to dirty also. I mean, you can put, you, you can pick the order in your SOPs, but you shouldn't be putting on your sterile gloves and then putting on your booties, obviously, because you're contaminating your sterile gloves. So um, just keep that in mind, make sure what makes sense for your facility is, is what you have in your SOPs and you've defined that and that's what your staff are, are following. Um, one change in 797 that they're definitely aware of and looking at for is the wipe down of eyeglasses. Um, this wasn't in old 797. Eyeglasses are definitely a source of contamination because people touch them a lot more than they realize. So really it's sterile alcohol probably is what most sites would use. The frames of the eyeglasses need to be wiped down before they go to compound every single time. So they'll be watching. Do you have a staff member with glasses who just walks in and starts compounding and doesn't complete this step? They don't have to wipe the lenses because you could damage those. And obviously that can be expensive, but the, the frames of the glasses do have to be wiped down prior to compounding. 
Um, earbuds probably didn't even exist in 2004 and 2008 when 797 came out, but they exist now and they're everywhere and they're a great source of bacteria. So um, no earbuds at all is called out in 797. Make sure your staff's not wearing those in any of the classified spaces, including the anteroom. No gum or food, not a big surprise there, but sometimes gum or mints or something can slide through. Um, this is a big one to, to look out for is you should not don or doff gloves in a hood. 797 states that you cannot have exposed skin in a hood. And so almost every side I've ever been in, if you watch enough staff uh, don or doff their gloves or you watch enough staff, um, you know, just prepare to mix, they will, someone will put their gloves on inside the hood. And they're just doing it because they're thinking, oh, these are sterile gloves and my hands are clean. I'm going to do it in a sterile hood. But it specifically states in 797, you cannot have exposed skin in there. So they should not be putting their gloves on or off in a hood. Um, if they have facial hair, beards are popular these days, need to be wearing a beard cover. Um, no jewelry, no makeup. That's nothing new. We've known about that for a long time. And then this is probably one of the big takeaways uh, from this one is what is the process for staff who don't have formal training documented? So what that means is, um, you know, of course, your pharmacy techs and pharmacists that are preparing medications, you have all this documentation and training, and they understand to not go across the line of demarcation um, in the ante room with their booties back and forth or something like that. But what about people who don't have that training but have to come into your classified areas? These might be vendors that certify your hoods. It might be your plant ops or maintenance department that repairs your hoods. It might be that person that has to come in and fix that hole in the wall that I was just telling you about that some cart made in the wall. How do you how are you sure that those people aren't bringing in dirty stuff and contaminating the area? How are you sure they're not walking in and then be like, oh, I forgot this out in my car and walking back and forth across the line of demarcation without changing their booties? So this needs to be defined in your policies, what you do in these scenarios. And what I would recommend is that you have some sort of signage on the outside of your classified space on the door to the ante room or however people access that says um, non-pharmacy staff must contact and you can list your designated person or your pharmacy manager, whoever you want to list, must contact this individual before accessing this area. You know, do not enter um, without you know, contacting this person first. And what this person can do, whoever you, you've designated, they can go over, uh, talk to this person and ensure that they understand how to move um, throughout the area and not contaminate things. They know how to wash their hands. They know how to garb appropriately and all that type of stuff. Just make sure you have, you don't have to do exactly that, but you do need to have something in place and you do need to follow it. Last slide here on observation, and this is really important. That's why it has its own slide. Um, there's more specific requirements on the movement of items in and out of the clean rooms and making sure you're not contaminating your spaces with the drug vials and syringes and things like that, the IV bags that you're bringing in. So surveyors are very aware of this and they are looking for it for sure. It's very easily observable if you violate this. Uh, the first part is carts must stay on the clean or dirty side. So they do not... Um, want to see a cart get loaded up with a bunch of meds and then someone just wheels it through the ante room right across the line of demarcation. If a cart crosses from dirty to clean, you have to wipe down the whole thing and disinfect it, including the casters and everything. And that's not realistic in practice. So you need to have a cart on the clean side, a cart on the dirty side and transfer items between the cart without either one ever crossing that, that line of demarcation. Now, when those items cross from the clean to dirty cart, or an item goes into a pass-through if you have it, or if it's brought into a segregated compounding area, if that's what you're if that's what you're mixing in, that product must be wiped down by a staff member who is wearing gloves with low lint wipers and a sporicidal disinfectant, an EPA registered disinfectant, or sterile 70% alcohol. Most people are probably going to use sterile 70% alcohol, but that means you take a bunch of vials and a couple syringes and someone's going to throw them in the pass-through. They have to be wiped down every single time before they go into that pass-through. So it'd be very easy for a surveyor to see someone walk up with a bunch of vials they need to mix and transfer it between carts or just throw it in the, in the pass-through and not wipe it down. And that would, be a, that would be a violation or a finding for sure. Similarly, anytime an item is introduced into a hood, it must be wiped down with sterile 70% alcohol. So, you know, even if you just transferred an item from the clean cart or from the dirty cart to the clean cart and wiped it down, once you get that to the hood, you have to wipe it down again, even if you're going straight into the hood. So 
Um, just keep that in mind and make sure your staff are aware of this. A couple exceptions, if it's a sterile product, it's packaged sterile and labeled sterile on the outside, and you can open the packaging and kind of dump the, the sterile vial or syringe into the hood without contaminating it, you don't have to wipe it down. That would be an exception. Also, if for some reason with how a label is printed on a vial or a bag, if you wipe it down with alcohol and it makes the label, you know, unreadable or illegible, then you would not have to do this because that would not be safe to have un unlabeled um, vials or syringes or bags floating around. So just keep that in mind. Last main section we'll talk about is the environmental monitoring. This is very important. You know, the entire, entire point of everything we've talked about so far in terms of training your staff and all this stuff we do and wiping down products before they um, come into your spaces and things like that are to keep your environment clean and make sure that you're increasing your chance that your, your products are staying clean. And so this environmental monitoring is really the testing to confirm that, hey, all these policies we have, all this training we have is actually working and your facility is operating appropriately. Um, you have to certify any classified spaces and hoods initially in every six months. That's not necessarily a change. It does state in 797, though, if you move a hood. So if because of workflow, you have to move a hood to an opposite side of a room or something, you actually do have to do a recertification. So just keep that in mind. Um, air sampling remains every six months. No change there. The surface sampling monthly, like we talked about before, that is really challenging. Um, but the important thing to remember with your air and surface, your, your viable sampling, is you have to have a diagram of the sampling locations. That is a requirement. And so just make sure that uh, whatever sites you do your air sampling, whatever sites you do your surface sampling, you know, you've kind of put some thought into it and it makes sense um, based on your workflow, what areas might be contamination risks and that you sample those sites and there is a diagram attached to you know, your environmental monitoring policy, it doesn't have to be some fancy architectural thing. You can just draw something up that shows the rough structure of, of your rooms and where your hoods are and tables and stuff. And what they're really looking for is if a surveyor sees you failed surface sampling at site six, they can look at this diagram and say, oh, site six, that's, you know, this table in the ante room or wherever. They can easily tell where it is. Make sure that there's a diagram of those, those sampling locations. Um, the air and surface action levels, meaning what cutoffs designates a failure, you know, in a in the air in the hood or the air in the clean room, the air in the ante room, those cutoffs stayed the same. But there is one major change that's really nice for for most most places is old 797 said even if you if you have if you have even one CFU of a highly pathogenic organism like pseudomonas or mold or fungus, that constituted a failure. And that caused a lot of problems for a lot of site, caused problems for some of my sites. Um, you know, you grow one CFU of some random thing on an air sample in the ante room and you'd have to fail and retest and all that type of stuff. That statement has been removed. Um, so hopefully that will will be valuable for for a lot of you. Um, also on environmental monitoring, this is kind of the focus, I would say, of the surveyors. They want to make sure that someone from your site actually looked at the results and took action on them. So those reports, it's stated, must be reviewed by your designated person. So you you can't just have your reports. They 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 look to, to see them. Show me your last environmental monitoring report. You provide it to them, and there's no documentation that anyone ever looked at it. Um, you're not meeting 797 requirements. So they need to sign and date it. I would recommend they initial or sign and date anywhere that you might have been, you know, any failures or out of limits, any other comments, and then obviously any action plans associated with those failures need to be documented very clearly. What they found is over the years, a lot of people use a vendor for this. The vendor said, oh, you passed and gave you back your reports. And you're like, great. And you filed it away on the counter, said you passed and waited six months to do anything. And then when a surveyor actually looked through it, you actually didn't pass. You were above a cutoff on, a, on an air sampling or your pressures were out of range and no one at the site actually ever looked at the results. They just took the vendor's word for it. So make sure someone's actually looking at your reports and documenting that. And then also they're looking for trends. You know, if you've grown nothing in your ante room air sampling forever, and then you grow five CFU, and then you grow 20 CFU, and then you grow 40 CFU, that's a trend you need to look at. Even if you're, you haven't you know, gone above the threshold to constitute a failure, you need to look at that, note that trend, it says in 797, and, you know, try to action plan around it. Ideally, you would note the trend and fix the problem before it becomes a failure. Um, so just keep that in mind. And, and you know, 
dealing with these action plans and, and air sampling and environmental monitoring is actually what kind of brings me here giving you this presentation today and kind of working in conjunction with Synexis. Um, one of our sites um, had a frequent problem where we were failing in the ante room on our air sampling. And um, if you've ever been in that environment, it's very stressful, a lot of action planning, a lot of time, effort, money associated with trying to re remediate this stuff. And, and there is even some board of pharmacies that have an automatic failure if you fail a um, air or surface sampling and they come on site and you haven't remediated it or haven't retested, you automatically fail your board of pharmacy inspection. And then you're expected to go, you know, depending on the state, you have to appear before the board or provide a bunch of documentation. It's a headache. So I was in the midst of all this and decided, you know, we're trying to do everything right, but we have an older facility that's just challenging to, to kind of keep up with, with what we need to do and what, what other options are out there. And when I started looking at options to kind of help us, you know, what, what external products or, or vendors provide a service or a product that can help us be more compliant in this area. And that's when I came across the Nexus and they're the sole producer of a process that uh, sole developer of a process that produces dry hydrogen peroxide or DHP. So, you know, it's, it's just like the hydrogen peroxide that, you know, you might've put on a wound or something when you were younger. Um, it's in the, the uh, brown bottles, but it's, it's aerosolized. It's, it's uh, dry hydrogen peroxide. It's just in the air. And, and the, the cool thing about DHP is it kills the vast majority of bacteria, viruses, and mold on contact. Um, you know, kind of the, the very basic view is the DHP is similar to structure in water, um, and it binds to receptors on the microbe surface and kill it. Um, you know, for those of you that like the specifics a little bit more, it really works through two kind of distinct mechanisms to, to continuously reduce the bio burden in your space. Um, first, it, it directly kills the pathogens. So for viral pathogens, it, it denatures their nucleic acid, uh, resulting in inactivation. And for bacterial pathogens, it actually passes into the cell because their cell membranes are, are semi-permeable semi to the hydrogen peroxide molecule. And the buildup of that eventually causes the cell to lice or die. Um, uh, similarly, uh, vegetated organisms like bacteria tend to not replicate when there's an environmental stressor like DHP in the environment. So um, it works through a lot of different mechanisms. It works on both uh, bacteria and viruses, like I stated. And, and one of the things that really piqued my interest with DHP and Synexis initially is they're one of the few uh, companies that could provide really good research or documentation of how their product worked in air and or surfaces for really specific organisms that were high interest to me and are high interest to a lot of hospitals like MRSA, VRE, pseudomonas, things like that. I mean, when you're looking at 99.99 reductions on surfaces or air um, in, 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 in intervals like one or two hours, I was like, okay, this is this is pretty cool. Let me look into this a little bit more. And so once I started looking into it more, um, you know, one of the best things about DHP is it flows wherever air flows. So, you know, like I said, it's aerosolized. So it, it floats around the room and all the little nooks and crannies, under counters, you know, behind hoods, up in the top corner of the room, um, all over the place. And it also settles out on the surfaces continually. So if you have some contaminated surfaces, that DHP is settling out. And, and as I showed on the previous slide, you know, it's killing these organisms on the surface very effectively. Um, it just utilizes the natural oxygen and humidity already in the room to create the DHP. So Synexis actually has um, some HVAC um, unit options as well as some individual uh, unit options, meaning like a standalone unit that produces the DHP. They're very small. They're very quiet. Um, the DHP is odorless, colorless. Um, you would, you don't even know it's there. If no one told you, um, no one would know it's there, but it's working in the background the whole time. Uh, another great thing is it operates 24-7, 365. There's no like, oh, I got to remember to turn it on. I got to remember to turn it off. I got to do all these steps. There's none of that. You kind of turn it on and forget about it. And the, the service or maintenance on them is very minimal, essentially every six months or, or 12 months or so, depending on you know what unit you have and what thing you're changing. You essentially have to change something that's like a filter um, that, that's simplified a little bit, but it's it's very easy. I actually do this myself at the sites that we have this uh, instituted in our clean rooms, and it's it's very easy, very straightforward, and very cost effective. 
And then the big thing, what, what finally tipped me over the edge, I guess, kind of to, to commit to, to trying this in our clean rooms was it safe for use in occupied spaces. When I looked at some of the other vendor products that were out there, um, they had a good product. Even some of them had some good data, but it wasn't safe for a person to be in the area while the process happened, or even sometimes for one, two or three or four hours after the process was done. And as you know, if you're you know at a busy hospital churning out IVs all day, you can't shut your clean room down for two hours um, so that you can let some cleaning process take place. And, and then additionally, as soon as that cleaning process is done and staff come back in, you know, people are the main source of the introduction of most of the contaminants. Um, you know, that process isn't really working again anymore until the next time you run. Um, whereas DHP is just running the whole time. And even as people come and go, it keeps running. And I don't want to say it's kind of cleaning up after them as they go, but it kind of is. And it's safe for them to be around. They can be around it all the time. And Synexus also has good, good studies and data on that that they could provide you if you needed it, that it is safe for use in occupied spaces. So we decided to, to based on the cost being very affordable, we thought this was a great product that could work for us. We put it in our clean rooms. And and I would say I, I'm, I'm comfortable stating that there's nothing we've done that's had a bigger impact than DHP for, for our clean rooms. And it, I sleep better at night and we have not failed a single testing since we put this in. Um, we even like the testing we just got last month in one of the areas that has this put in, I mean, we grew nothing on every surface, every air sample in every area, anti-room, hazardous mixing room, clean room, did not grow a single CFU of anything. And, you know, that's possible. That's partly due to good processes and the staff doing what they need to do. But the huge part of having results that strong is is the DHP uh, running all the time. It really does work. Um, it's really cost affordable and uh, it's effective. So um, I want to thank you guys all for for being here today. I know some of you sent some questions in via email. Many of those questions were answered throughout the presentation. Uh, for those that weren't or maybe required a little further clarification, we'll be reaching out to you and, and providing some more information. Um, if you want to learn more about DHP or Synexis, uh, get a hold of Scott. His email is up there on the screen. If you have more maybe 797 specific questions or you want a clarification on something from 797 or maybe something I stated today, uh, feel free to reach out to Denise. Uh, her email is on there. And again, I just thank you all for taking the time to be here today and uh, wish you best of luck in your 797 compliance. Thank you.